I'll tell you what. So since we are back to recording um, and uploading our video version, so you guys can hear us and see us, we have to showcase our amazing Yeti. Um, Yeti cups. Yeti cups. Yeti is it? Yeti mugs. So huge thank you to Nick and Desi Jamard. Of course, Nick Jamard, Tommy DeVito. Tommy D. Hello. Tommy D. Uh, but to me, let's introduce our, our guest. Let's introduce him. Let's do it. Let's get into it. Tony Lawrence Clemens. Okay. So he, he grew up in New Hampshire. And until he was about five years old, he actually wanted to be a marine biologist. Well, in an interview he had with Go Pride Chicago, um, he said that he saw a cousin in a production of Once on this Island, and he was hooked. And through the years, he um, his music teachers discovered that Tony had a very high range Tony bound for the Tonys, come on, had a very high range and, <laughs> and started giving him none other than Four Seasons music to work on. Classic. Perfect. And all along, he also did community theater, of course, and all this led him to pursue his BFA in musical theater from Pace University. While at Pace, he performed in a production of Benj Pasek and Justin Paul's Dogfight and even got to meet the famed composer and lyricist duo who also wrote and conceived Dear Van Hansen. They wrote music and lyrics for the P. Team Barnum biopic, The Greatest Showman, and Woo! wrote lyrics for Damien Chazelle's hit film La La Land, Woo! which was one of Gia's favorite films, and so much more. And not only that, he performed in a Lincoln Center production of Stephen Sondheim's Sweeney Todd, starring Emma Thompson and Bryn Terfell as Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd, respectively. Of course, we also know and love Emma Thompson from her countless, countless movie roles. And of course, Bryn Terfell, Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, the best, the best, the best, the best. And after graduating Pace, he performed in multiple regional, the regional theaters, including the Palace Theater in Manchester, New Hampshire, and the Forestburg Playhouse in Sullivan County, New York. And throughout all this time, you could always catch Tony Lawrence Clements at the August Wilson Theater or at any major touring house where he could catch a performance of Jersey Boys. He even has a funny story about one of the times he saw it on Broadway where, uh, how shall we say, there was a little bit of a mix up in casting. <laughs> He'll go into that. Through and through, he kept coming back to Jersey Boys. And then he was finally cast as a swing and a Frankie Valley understudy on Tour 3 in 2018. And we're so happy to have him tonight in the Zoom studio. Please welcome Tony Lawrence Clemens. Hi, everyone. Yay. My first podcast ever. Very excited. Oh. We're I know. so honored that this is the first one that you're on. with on. Well, podcast it's the only one I'd ever want to be on. Oh well, thank you. So well, Tony <laughs> has told us he is he has listened to several episodes of our podcast. Tony, we are so thankful for you. Thank you so much. And also, okay, so for, for everyone to know, we are recording this episode on June 9th. It's a Wednesday, and tomorrow, actually, right, no, right now, there is the In the Heights premiere right near where Tony lives. So do you hear anything right now, Tony, on the street? I think Lynn is screaming outside my window. I don't That know. makes There's sense. Something yeah. crazy is going on outside. I don't really know. <laughs> he, he, he was on Jimmy Fallon last night and now he's at Tony's house. That's just right. that's New York. That's how it works. <laughs> the second best place in New York, my two bedroom apartment. <laughs> I Hey, I, I'm down. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> So we have to ask, so for, for Jersey Boys, are you the youngest Frankie cast? I, I know I'm one of the youngest. I think I'm actually sandwiched between two of the youngest. I think, oh, I think Ben, who I replaced is Ben Bogan. Ben Bogan, I think is maybe a year younger than me. Okay. Maybe two. Um, and then I know that Bruno is uh, a little bit younger than me, but I think Bruno maybe between the three of us, we are maybe some of the younger ones. Well, that is a huge accomplishment. So I know, right? Congratulations. That's amazing. Thanks. And, and as, as your swing too, it's a certain brain that needs to do 1, it. 1,000%. Hashtag swing brain. You're, you're memorizing the lines, you're memorizing the blocking, you're memorizing where to stand, but having to learn different vocal parts mm -hmm. on different tracks and then mm -hmm. ha having to be able to sing Frankie as well, you know? So um, you... It's, it's just fucking amazing, man. Yeah, you just have to be right at the drop of a hat. It took a few months to relax. Um, when I first got the job, I was asking some of my friends who I knew had swung before and just any advice because, you know, it's my first time. I had no idea what I was doing. I just had to figure out my way of doing it. 
And what that ended up being was male swing one is usually the first to go on for Frankie. Um, if oh, the normal okay. Frankie calls out, um, just, it's easier for, for costumes. You know, you don't have to switch as many things out. Sure. Um, if you put, you know, Pesci on for Frankie. And so they started rehearsing me immediately just for Frankie. And so that was, you know, I really had to take it one by one because if I tried to do all three at the same time, it wouldn't have happened. So during rehearsals, um, I just learned Frankie, which was very helpful because that was obviously the one that I was most nervous about. <laughs> um, and so I just took it one track at a time. Um, and then eventually within the next few months, I kind of had a good grasp on uh, what each track required and um during rehearsals they would uh so johnny who was the frankie on tour with me johnny wexler they, johnny wexler yes yeah uh doodle bob's own johnny wexler um <laughs> <laughs> they would um sometimes they would switch us out so like i would watch johnny do the scene and they didn't say like do what johnny does but like you know number wise stand where johnny's standing and then you know, Richard would be like, okay, Tony, your turn. And so that was um, kind of the final oh, week of rehearsals. Okay. And even during tech, they would switch us out just because, you know, I went on, I went on for Frankie uh, the second week of tour, maybe. Oh, wow. Yeah, very quick, but it was planned. So I knew this day is coming. This is when it's happening. You have plenty of time pre to prepare. And I felt very ready when I got to go on. Um, but you did not have Frankie camp? I did not have Frankie camp. At my final callback before I booked it, Richard Hester, who I'm sure everyone knows, uh, Richard asked why I never did Frankie camp. And I said, well, you know, I went in for it, but I, I didn't hear anything. You know, the politest way I could say, you didn't want me. <laughs> um, and he realized, oh, you know, we actually stopped doing Frankie camp that year. So um that made me feel a little better what is your definition of bombing an audition because i know everyone thinks things differently sure so you know with these early auditions i you know i've cracked i've forgotten lyrics it's whatever things like that are totally fine it was just kind of the perfect storm of things that could go wrong for this bronx tale audition it was a very very last minute replacement um for i think broadway and so I was working my restaurant job as you do. And I got probably 40 pages of material to prepare for the next morning. Whoa. Yeah. And I, you know, obviously panic set in and, you know, they told me you'll be able to go in and choose which songs do you want to do? I'm like, great. I auditioned for at paper mill, paper mill, paper mill. I know some of these songs. Um, okay. I'll just choose these ones that I know. Turns out everyone at the audition knew all of the music because we went through it all together for some reason. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, everyone knows every single song. And I had about an hour before I had to go back in for my appointment. And I just tried to cram. Um, oh, no, well, I should say that morning was the dance call. Okay. And I was running late. I the tra trains weren't running, you know, in Astoria, the trains yep. are always messed up. Mm -hmm. And so I hopped in a cab, but it was nine in the morning. So it was rush hour. <laughs> so I was late to the dance audition. Long story short, I ended up spraining my ankle in the dance audition, <laughs> but like, but didn't tell anyone and really tried to push through it. Yeah. And so as time went on, my, my sneakers getting a little tighter. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is bad. My ankle is completely swollen. Yeah. and I can hardly walk. Um, so that was the first part. Then music happened. Uh, Smitty ended up having to plunk the melody line for me as I'm trying to like get through this song. Um, Cause they were like, oh, uh, sing this song. And of course it wasn't one of the songs that I had prepared. Oh, God. And so uh, Smitty's plunking along, I'm sweating. You know, I have the flop sweat. Um, so embarrassing so that is my definition of completely bombing an audition it was mortifying I I walked out of Pearl I 
ran into the stairwell and just started sobbing because I was so embarrassed. And I thought this ruined my entire career with, you know, wanting to be in Jersey boys eventually. And I'm like, okay, it's never going to happen because of this one audition. And I'm here to say that it's absolutely not true because, you know, they ended up casting me uh, a year or two later. So yeah. you know, you're going, you know, coming, coming out of, you know, this, this, the whole, this whole story of, you know, of your Bronx Tale audition. Um, I, I, I didn't go to a BFA program, so I can't speak to how a lot of BFA programs teach, but did, did Pace, like, did they ever explain to you what auditioning was going to be like, what it was going to like waking up at 4 35 in the morning, waiting in lines, waiting in the non-equity line, mm -hmm. you know, until you get your card, having to be on the lists. Um, and then the list might get thrown out or they might say, we're not seeing non-equity people today. And yeah, so did I mean, the great thing about going, well, I guess there are two sides to it. The great thing about going to school in New York is your, I think it's our sophomore year. We're allowed to start auditioning, but only with approval from the head of the program. So oh, we, ha okay. we had to, we had to go to them and be like, I I'm thinking about going to this audition and they would say, sure, go ahead. Or, uh, I don't know, maybe hold off. And then once you get to senior year, you're able to audition freely. Just like skip long, class. Well, as long as you don't miss class. That's the oh. thing. Yeah. Oh, so for the first two years, you're not even allowed to audition for like, if you go to pace, you are mm -hmm. not allowed to audition for anything. And sophomore, and, you know, of year, course, some people, you know, some people do it, go anyway, with, right. you know, and you, no one really knows. Right. Um, but yeah, but by senior year, you're able to audition. And of course, if you, you know, people come into pace, you know, with Broadway credits and they already have agents. So agent appointments are a different thing. If you have an appointment, you're, you're pretty much allowed to go. Oh my uh, God. But any open this calls is... or anything like that. So you're able to learn about the audition process by literally doing it. Yeah. And then the other side is going to school in New York. You're like, I've lived in New York for four years and, you know, I'm, I'm behind. I haven't booked anything. And it's like, well, no, you're in school to learn right. and you're in school to train. Mm -hmm. um, so I honestly didn't really audition that much when I was in school because I really wanted to focus on the training. But, you know, anytime a Jersey Boys call came up, you know, I was there. And you know what? Yeah. You were exactly where you're supposed to be when you performed Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Lini Todd while in pace now. <laughs> nice <Was> segue. That... <laughs> Thank you. Was this when, was that your sophomore, junior, senior year? It was my, I think my junior year. Um, so you and had so, to go ahead. Yeah. So basically what happened was the head of our program at the time, she had a relationship with Lonnie Price and you're wearing a oh, Merrily shirt, shit. which we love. Yes. Hello. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> Lonnie directed that production and he reached out being like, hey, we need some coverage for the principals. They, you know, it was filmed. So mm -hmm. they wanted to um, figuring out staging for it, uh, how it would work with the cameras. So probably maybe seven of us got to go in and do pre-pro for the entire production. That's sick. And then later on, we got to be there for all of the rehearsals. Uh, you know, when Emma was there and I, as if I can call her Emma, like we're not on a you know, first name. Basis. <laughs> well, you have some like amazing photos with her. I know. I have also... some really awesome photos with her. <laughs> and she, she's exactly what you want her to be. Oh, she is so kind. She's so dedicated. She's so focused. She's so funny. She's so charismatic. Um, so we got to be there for all of the rehearsals. And I got lucky because the, the guy who was playing Toby, he was still in school. So he was in school during the day up until three o'clock. So I got to do all of the scenes, all of the songs. I got to sing Not While I'm Around with Emma Thompson, which is a highlight of my life. <laughs> um, and so we got to be very involved with that. And it was honestly the coolest, coolest experience to see these major mega stars seeing their process with how they work 
Philip Quast as Philip Judge Quast. Turpin. Oh yes. my God. Yeah. I and mean, I, I know Philip Quast originally from the 10th anniversary of Les Mis. Of course. Javert, of course. That's how like I knew him. Sick, man. It was yeah. Kyle Brand. Kyle Brand. Yeah. The sweetest, sweetest boy. He's now probably, I don't know, in his early 20s. By the time I think he was 16. Um, Why did I like, think Christian Borrell would play Tobias? Right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> who knows i um, mean christian was so cool too he i That's forget like, what he was doing at the time but he had to pop in very late so he was only around for a couple days um and then delivered that masterful performance as pirelli wow. um well, yeah the whole part. the whole thing was so cool it was so cool like what you've done and you're in, in such a short amount of time is so beyond impressive really oh thank you you know again you're always comparing yourself to other people so to me, I'm like, I haven't done anything. What am I doing with my life? Um, so that's very nice no, of you to I, say. It's, Thank it's, you. I mean, that's totally understandable, man. I mean, I, yeah. I, it's just, it, but, you, re, re, and that's what, that's what we're here for. We're here to build exactly. you up, you baby. Me up. Something I've realized is it's, it's very hard for me to take a compliment. I have uh, two yeah. friends who really rag on me when they try to compliment me. And I'm like, well, no, no, no. And they're like, stop doing that. So working on that. So in 2012, that was when you first saw Jersey Boys. Yes, yes, yes. What happened? <laughs> so that was, um, that must have been my freshman year in college. Um, I guess going a little further back, you mentioned that my music teacher introduced me to Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. Uh, and, you know, she chose some songs to kind of feature me as Frankie Valley, like in this um, spring concert that they do every year with the whole music spring. department. Yeah. Oh, yes. There we go. <laughs> you don't miss anything. <laughs> we don't. We don't. right. I love it. No, I love it. Um, and so I sang some Frankie stuff. And uh, looking back, I'm like, you know, I was in high school, and I'm like, oof, like that is rough, <laughs> really rough. Um, but then, so, but I didn't really know about Jersey Boys, the musical, and so my freshman year my boyfriend was visiting and we were looking to just catch a show that night. I was like, Oh, why don't we, why don't we go see Jersey boys? I, you know, I know some of the music I, I've been told that this is a role I'm going to play one day. Let's go check it out. Obviously completely fell in love. You know, the, well, of course the moment it started, I was like, what's going on? What, you know, which is exactly what they, they wanted. Yep. And I was like, Ooh, they got me. <laughs> um, now, what moment for you stood out? in the show like what what cinched it for you looking back um honestly frankie's entrance mm -hmm. because i was like that's the voice that's the guy mm -hmm. um honestly big three uh the end of act one dawn those stadium uh, lights of course uh, and i know everybody says uh, that but it is it's it so is good so mark magical. edwards also says that yeah, we also but, say that it's come on it's yeah pure des genius it's genius um also the guys coming from the floor at the end for ragdoll like th those oh, were cool. huge standouts those are so the top five that's for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the best <laughs> so but but so somebody confused you with someone oh so this was this was so crazy this was um i think one of the I think the year before I booked it. So it was in final callbacks for it the year before. And my parents were in town. I had the audition the following week. And I, I honestly think I saw Jersey Boys three times that weekend. Because I was like, I will book this. Amazing. I'm going to book this. <laughs> um, That's like and also, ideal weekend. And, right, exactly. And so <laughs> at, at the time... I knew that it was a long running show. I knew that they were looking for something very specific, uh, which had been communicated to me in the audition room itself. Um, and so I was like, I really need to study who this guy is. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to copy anybody, but really focused on his journey from start to finish. And so we, you know, we got cheap tickets. We were sitting in the back of the orchestra and uh, one of the ushers he must have known that they were casting or that like a new Frankie was coming in. And so he comes up to me and he goes, 
why, why aren't you uh, sitting in the front? And I was like, oh, these, these are my tickets. Uh, th- you know, these are where we're supposed to sit. He's like, no, 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 go, go to the front. You're the new Frankie, right? And I was like, <laughs> no. I was like, oh, well, not my- yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was like, oh, no. Um, no, I, you know, oddly enough, like I have my final callback this weekend or uh, this week for the, I'm assuming maybe Pesci and Frankie. I'm not really sure. And so um, he was like, oh, well, let me, there's some open seats. Let me, let me move you down to the front. Wow. So my, my parents and I were sitting like 10th row center ah, um, because on. they thought that I was the, the new Frankie coming in. Come on. And, I'm like, we, and, and now I'm like, we all look the same. So it is, it's very easy to confuse us. It's a sign, Tony. It's a sign, Tony. Right. Yeah. So I was like, well, literally I was like, well, that means I'm going to book it. Mm-hmm. Didn't book it that year. <laughs> um, uh, but but then book on it. to the next. Yeah. And then I did book it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that was August 24th, 2012. When you first saw it or when, when you saw it that, that time. Yes, that was my very first time seeing it. Gotcha. And then, so you were cast in September, on September 10th, 2018. Is that the correct mm-hmm. date? That's when the official announcement came out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I booked it in July of that year. July. So I, do, I, I had to wait and oh, to you tell. Oh, you know, on that shit. I was. But, you know, of course, I told, like, my closest friends and of course. My family. Of course. Yeah. Okay. That, so, so, okay. So then how did that work exactly? Um like, like, did you have to do like one extra thing before they made the final decision in July? And then, so I, you know, I went through the whole process, you know, I had, I had to dance, I had to do all of the scenes um, and all the songs that they, they ask you to do. And I think I probably went through maybe three rounds, like an initial appointment, uh, a callback, no, maybe for a work session and then a final callback where they filmed everything to send to Des and Ron and the whole team. Right. Um, and I think it was just Richard in the room for that. Or, and maybe Lindsay from Tara Rubin, I think was there. Okay. Well, so one of the things that you have to sing is, is working. Yes. Yeah. Could you, could you sing a bar for, for us? Or is it just the part that you have to do? i let it get away. Is that the right key? You, you would know. <laughs> team, right? You were just what? a little. You were just a little sharp. Okay. Well, no, you know. Oh my God! What are we ready so they... from Mary? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> you no, know, but that was a really that was a really strong mix, bro. Oh, you know. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was a really well, really strong mix. Yes, um, Tony. <laughs> uh, so they have you do that. They um they start a few steps below what you do in the show, and then they work. You- Working my way back to they work you know, it up exactly. <laughs> work it up the um, scale, yeah. And they do the same thing for um what they call the uh the flight, which is the walk like a man. Ooh-wee-oo. So you do that. They work your way up to that. Um, and so and they even sometimes do that in random calls just to see when you go in on your own. They're like, okay, can you do it? So the first time I got to do that, I'm like, okay, one step closer. Like that now they're now they're seeing if I can I'm do one it. One step higher than the rest. Yeah. God, you're so good. <laughs> Talking about the high notes and mm-hmm. what, what what you have to sing in the audition. Can you tell us about your high note in Rock of Ages, sir? Oh my God. Your Rock of Ages don't stop believing story. I like to say it's um my uh, Eden Espinosa moment where yes. uh, in Wicked when she goes up to that high F in No Good mm-hmm. Deed. Mm-hmm. I was like, let, let's get this trending. Let's get it going. But, um, you know, it started as an accident or not an accident, but a joke in a way where we were at a brush up rehearsal. Which, and by uh, the way, you also sang that high F and walk like a man. <laughs> That's true. That's yes, true. Yes, work. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we were at a brush up rehearsal and, you know, we were just kind of goofing around, um, you know, and ma- I guess maybe I was uh, in good voice that day. So, um, you know, I, I go out and I do the little opt up moment and uh, everyone was like, oh, you have to put that into the show. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, I mean, Franz and Rock of Ages is already kind of extra, but, you know, might as well just put a real uh, 
exclamation point at the end of the show. <laughs> um, so I uh, opted up to that. Uh, what G is it? Sharp. G sharp or A or, flat or A flat as you know. A flat Tony, as I Tony like to likes say. A flats. He doesn't like G sharp. Sounds better. It sounds more impressive. <laughs> um, and then uh, it was caught on film, uh, thankfully. And then I just posted it, being like, "Happy closing!" Like the, you know, this is this is what I'm Work. doing, right? <laughs> And then, um, then my friend Jimmy, who runs the Let's Hear It for the Choice account on Instagram. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, uh, you know, he just posts clips of like people making crazy choices. So who, who's your friend who runs the account? My friend Jimmy Larkin runs Jimmy that account. Larkin. My God. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. Thank so he, he posted it for my birthday because uh, we also went to school together at Pace. And well, so he posted it for my birthday and it got some traction. And uh, that's kind of... I that's kind of where I peaked at this point. So <laughs> <laughs> not at all, dude, you have, you have, you, you know, you're climbing the ladder of success, man. You're, wor- you're working your way higher up. than the rest. Yeah. <laughs> you so got you the guts there. You walked. So your Frankie could run. That had to be oh, it. honestly. Exactly. It. You're so it. right. Yes. Franz walked. So fr- Franz, Frankie, come on! It's all it, it, coming it, it together. Writes, it all it, it writes itself. It, fuck, <laughs> it really does. Fuck, it fucking writes itself. <laughs> From Franz to Frankie, it was totally- I know. And and honestly, what a what a leap that is from playing a, a German boy, a very flamboyant German boy, to you know Frankie Valley from the streets. Of straight, straight, straight as a stick. Ex- Frankie Valley, literally, exactly. <laughs> Well, okay. So, so you had, so you got the part, you got this amazing, like, so, and you were, you played Frankie in Atlantic city. That was the, that was within the first week of your being on tour. No, we, we closed oh. in Atlantic city. Oh, you closed? Uh, oh. Yeah. So that, that, oh. that in- initially wasn't planned when uh, we all signed our contracts. We find out, found out about Atlantic city. I want to say in like maybe March of the, you know, we were, our contracts were supposed to end in June. We, found out in March, I think, that we were going to play. Did we play four weeks in Atlantic City? Yeah, it was a lot. It was a, it was. A yeah, long we run. did four weeks. I think it started as two and then got extended to four. I think. Um, what was the, what so was my, the my last like Frankie was in Atlantic City. Wow. Um, so we were at um, so there's <laughs> the Hard Rock and then there's a separate theater. I forget what it's called, like the like the blue wave theater or something, okay, gotcha. uh, but it's connect. It's connected to, it's hard, connected rock. to the I, hard rock. Okay. Please it, fact it, check that. I literally okay. don't know. Like yeah. theater. <laughs> is, is there like a, is there like a, a walk, like a, a walk through, like a pass that you could go in between? Walk like a man. Um, walk like a man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it was cool because our hotel was right next to the theater. So if it was, and there was an indoor walkway that could just bring us right to the lobby of the theater. So if it was raining, we didn't even have to go outside, which is awesome. Yeah. Were you guys staying at the Hard Rock? No, we were at um, the Showboat, which is right the next showboat. to Hard Rock. Gotcha. I, I wish we were at the Hard Rock. <laughs> the Hard Rock. It was, it was literally, you know, 50 yeah. steps away from our hotel. Okay, so I am a sweater. Not like Corey Greenan. Corey Greenan <laughs> is, a, is a whole <laughs> other level of sweat. Hey, me too. Um, like the show would start and he'd be sweating. Um, but as you know, the only real break that Frankie has in act one is, oh, what a night oh, and a night. Uh, my boyfriend's back. Mm-hmm. And so at that time, you know, we just finished big three. We're in those red jackets that don't breathe at all. We're in the light purple shirt, a sweater's worst nightmare. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, I would run off stage. I'd grab my water bottle. I would take the purple shirt off and I would have to blow dry my shirt dry because the next scene, I'm not wearing any jacket, but I'm wearing the purple shirt and I'm not trying to look like I jumped into a swimming pool for my fight with Mary into my eyes adored you. Wow. I think it'd be a little distracting. Um, so yeah, I'd be like, you know, I'd use the bathroom. I would blow dry my shirt, grab some water and then get back out there. Yep. It was the only option. Right. Well, right. Why aren't 
there showers backstage when you're done with the show? Like, are, are yeah. there in any theaters that you've been in around the country? Most of most of the theaters have showers, which is great. And it's, so it's rules, it's equity rules. Mm-hmm. It? I think for principals, principals have to have a shower yeah. in their dressing mm-hmm. room. Equity and sometimes rules. they weren't private showers, but right. a shower was available. You know, if we were in an arena, it'd be a locker room, but there are there were showers. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so thank you for correcting mm-hmm. me. I didn't realize that. Okay. I would never shower after the show, but I would definitely shower before the show, get it steamed up, do my warm up, um, and shave my face because I had to shave every time I was on because my facial hair grows so quickly. <sighs> Um, I'm jealous. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, again a blessing and a curse. Um, but yeah, so the showers were also very useful. If I could shower after Big Three, I would have, but there was no time. <laughs> of course. Wow. Okay, well, that's that's fascinating. Which I had no idea. It's, mm-hmm. it's like Lily one. She was in the shower. She was <laughs> in the shower. <laughs> Can you tell us about your first performance as Frankie? Yeah. Um, so I. On our opening night, so we opened in Springfield, Ohio, and I had my put in that morning. Um, Thank God you had a put in. I know, right? Uh, For those who don't know, I'm sure most people who listen to this know a put in is when you are literally being put into the show. So Johnny had the morning off. I was on as Frankie for my put in. I'm the only one in costume. Um, I think we had a full band, um, but then that night it went very well that night during the show, I had like a two hour note session with Richard, um, just to get me ready. And then at that note session, he was like, you are going to be going on next week. And, uh, in, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas. Wow. I literally can't remember. I think it was Fayetteville or Kansas. Um, And so that was, I think a week and a half out. I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to watch the show every day. I'm going to track Johnny backstage. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to feel ready. And so the day comes, uh, I wake up, I get some food and then uh, I go to the theater super early. I, you know, meditate I center myself ready to go and then <clears throat> excuse me the show starts I'm standing on the bridge I feel so ready like I got this I feel very calm I've done the work I feel prepared and right before I go on I'm like oh I you know I'm good I'm going to I'm going to remember every moment of this this is going to be great they go you're on the wrong block. I run out. I don't remember a thing. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm singing Can't Take My Eyes Off You. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know how I'm already at this part. Uh, okay, but here we are. Um, the song ends. I remember every moment of that, which is great. I'm very happy that I remember that. And then next thing I know, I'm bowing <laughs> and it's over. You know, I'm looking around. I'm like, okay, no one's bleeding. Every cast member is on stage. I didn't kill anyone. Um, and it was funny because during rehearsals, uh, Diana, who uh, taught the show or taught me the show, who's also the dance captain at New World. Diana Barger? Yes. Yes. Incredible. Literally couldn't have done this without her. And Love so her. we always had this joke where, you know, she was teaching me the curtain call. It's, you know, it's obviously all very choreographed. Um And we had like had this running joke that she was like, you're not going to remember anything, but you will remember this moment. You know, when he goes at the end Mm -hmm. uh, for bows before into Oh, what a night. And, you know, we always had this joke that I would just like look down, somehow be covered in blood, like not knowing how I got there. And like, no one's on stage with me. I'm like, what "What happened? Your pants are down. Exactly. (laughs) Just everything went wrong. But luckily everyone was there. Uh, and no one got hurt. I didn't get hurt. Um, but it was amazing. Th- those little moments that I do remember, I will remember forever. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, well, standing O for you, Tony. A standing O, a standing O, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Oh, thank you. 
Well, okay, so, well, so you have your Frankie blackout. We also blacked uh-huh. out when you played Bob Crew. What happened I blacked there? Out. Okay, so I blacked out when I played Bob Crew because it was very unexpected and silly me thought that I would never go on for Bob Crew. Um, because, you know, there, there is kind of a, not a hierarchy, but one person is always going to be the first to put on, be first on. And at that point it was, um, sacrificial lamb. Exactly. <laughs> um, it was, uh, another swing kit, uh, kit Trees. Was, uh, kit Trees, Yes. Who I love. Um, he was always going to be the first one to go on for crew. And so uh, it was a crazy perfect storm where Eric Chambliss, who played Bob Gaudio, he had a sinus infection and was so sick, couldn't even sing. He calls out. So then Wade Dooley was going to play um, Gaudio and Kit was going to go on for Wade, for crew. That night, uh, Kit had a crazy stomach bug or like something was going on. I don't know if it was food poisoning or whatever. Uh, our stage manager calls him that morning to say, Hey, you're on for crew. He picks up the phone and he's like, hello, <laughs> like can't speak. And she goes, um, I really don't like the way you sound. So get some rest. I'm going to call Tony. Oh my God. And Kit had warned me that I, I should be getting a call from Suzanne very soon. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh shit, this is happening. (laughs) This is happening. And so I see her calling. I answer the phone and she goes, hey, um, you're going on for Bob Crew tonight. Some context, I never had a full rehearsal for Bob Crew at this point. Um, You know, we, because our schedule is so crazy, we weren't always able to have a full rehearsal. because we weren't in the city long enough. And mm-hmm. so I, whenever we did have rehearsal, I would usually be rehearsing Pesci um, while the other understudy would do Frankie. And I would kind of hop back and forth. There's one rehearsal where I literally played Frankie, Pesci and Bob Crew, but I never <laughs> had some out running around like a crazy person. Um, but I never had a full run through of crew and you know I trailed a few times backstage to you know look at costume changes because he has some crazy changes and I'm like okay I've never done this before but um I know the lines and the blocking so uh let's just go from there and Elisa our wardrobe supervisor literally carried me through that show because I'd be doing one change and she'd say, okay, next time you're off stage, meet me over here. I'm putting you into this costume, do this, this, and this. And she would literally just push me out on stage. <laughs> I, I remember my entrance as crew. Um, I remember trying to get the gun out of my pocket and it got stuck in my pocket. So there was a, a little moment where the gun didn't really go off. Um, I, I got there, but it seemed like 10 minutes, but really it was maybe three second delay for the gunshot. Uh-huh. And then, um, and then my final speech as crew before the hall of fame, I remember that. And then the power went out during uh, oh. the monologues, what? the power, the power fully went out. Um, so they were doing these monologues with like very limited lighting, no microphones, the entire block went out. I forget where we were the entire block lost power. Wow. So slowly by the time everyone got through their monologues, we were able to have some lighting. Oh, you didn't stop. Oh, we didn't stop. We, we stopped one time while I was on tour, but every other time. Is that allowed? Because when that, when that, I could remember (laughs) that, remember that citywide power outage. Yeah. Yeah. They had to stop. We were in Atlantic city. (laughs) Oh, 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 so that was, 2019. Wow. So, but, 2019. But this, okay. In Manhattan, they had that blackout. Yeah. Right. So they, they I know they evacuated New World Stage. They evacuated mm-hmm. all theaters. So I, I, I thought maybe, oh, it's like a rule. Like, I don't know. Have, I mean, I think the theater had a the generator. Mm-hmm. I think it had a pretty powerful generator that was able to still have lighting and still, you know, have all the safety measures. And then 
but we had no band. So we're like, is the band going to come in on time for who loves you? Like we'll see. And luckily the band came in. Oh my. And you guys had no clue and you had no, (laughs) were you guys, were you guys looking at a conductor cam? Um, we must've been. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then we come out and like all the house lights are on while we're doing who loves you. Like we have very limited lighting on stage. I was like, this is the, maybe the worst finale of a musical ever because it's so boring. It's the worst nightmare to be able to see the audience. So that was my, uh, that was my debut as Bob crew. (laughs) Very eventful, very eventful. Could you walk us through the crew track? We never really discussed it on the show. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah. God, if I can remember, I should like pull up my notes wherever they are. Um, so you start, you're a, you dance and say soi. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he's a waiter at the, at the, um, the club, right? That that's, um, Pesci now. Oh. So after say swat, uh, crew becomes the judge crew. Right. He does the judge. He plays Donnie. Yes. Which is actually a very funny story. When I was on for crew, yep. it was, um, Johnny Wexler and Corey Greenan. And so, you know, the table, at, you know, I'm five, seven, the table is a little tall, you know, that long table. And so, you know, I come out in the judge robe. I have the glasses. I look crazy. And so, you know, the first line, how old are you? I, I, you know, have my hands up on the table. I'm like, how old are you? And I look at Johnny Wexler and he, no joke, looks at me like this. Mouth open, like what is going on? And of course I'm, it's the beginning of the show. I'm panicking. I'm like, what, what have I done? What did I do wrong? He's literally laughing at me. And so then after the show I was like why were you laughing at me in the courtroom scene he was like you were asking me how old I was but I wanted to ask you how old are you oh my god behind this tall table being like how old are you oh my god like you you were a toddler in that judge robe (laughs) oh my gosh and Um, you're freaking out Okay. Meanwhile, Freak, freaking out, thinking that like I did something wrong when really he is just laughing in my face. Yeah, how was. crazy I look! I'm so sorry. Um, oh, you know, it's classic Johnny. Um, Johnny. But that was like a running joke for the remainder of tour. Uh-huh. Um, Wait, so Tony, how old are you? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm 28. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, young man. <laughs> right, and so then he's Donny, and then. I think he has a nice little break and then he's crew. Um, I think he's crew crew for the rest of act one. He's crew for the rest of act one. That's correct. I think. And then um, act two, I think it's a lot of, he plays a studio exec at the end. He, 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 he rolls on in the chair Yes, 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 yes. He can't take. Uh huh. Um, and then he's also he's also one of the cops, right? Yep, brings on the toilets. Yeah. Um, you remember? You know? You know way more than I do, and I literally (laughs) did it. Um, and then he's crew for the end. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I think that's most of it. Oh, and then I think he's a um patron during begging he's a he's yes. a gangster during um the sit down okay mm-hmm. he's he's standing on top yeah yeah man one and man two are the gangsters you know, now for for years i called it a catwalk because i mean like that's kind of that's like the technical oh, term. yeah right but it, it wasn't until we met joey paradise mm-hmm. that he's that he was he, he used he's that's the first time we Oh, at least I, I don't know about you, Gia. That was the first time I ever heard the word bridge yeah. associated with the catwalk. No, I always thought it was a bridge. Really? You're just you you just That's you're so just a little more creative than the rest of us. No, you have a creative mind. I would just like a bridge, Jersey to New York. You know, the whole wait, thing. <gasps> wait, that's wait. brilliant. No, but like symbolically, that's what I was thinking. But it's also like the bridge that- from earth to heaven because people walk the bridge and they exactly. die. Yes. wait yeah. well, wait the stairway, the stairway to heaven to the stairway 
Yeah. Literally. Yep. These guys are brilliant. The f- They're Those brilliant. are the discoveries on Silhouette to Davy Piquez. Right? Like- <laughs> Come on, guys. This Add is, it to the this list. Is the exclusive, no, yeah, I, I never exclusive thought- content. It's right. Just, I, I never thought to think of it as a catwalk. I mean, it's, it totally works either way. Because well, in, hey, Hamilton, we in Hamilton, yeah, we love a catwalk. <laughs> in Hamilton, they call it a catwalk, or at least. Oh, really? That I've heard. Yeah, at least that I've oh, heard. Because because they have they also have that. Listen, yeah. the set for Hamilton looks a lot Garrily like the set similar. for Jersey Boys. Hmm. Howell, Howell, no, obviously Howell didn't design the set. Yeah, he didn't have the lights, but. Howell, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Yeah. yeah. No, but this is where like the niche technical um parts really come into play because you mentioned yeah. man, one, man one, man two, man three, which mm-hmm. we never heard of before. Um. Yeah, we always heard Barry Belson, Frankie Nolan. Howie yeah, and Miller. that's the way that's the way it's built in the program, I think. Um, but I think tracking wise, they just call it this is man one, this is man two, man three, man four for people who are in the show. We have yes. to get hands on a playbill from the third national because I, I just, I have no idea. I've never seen that before. So, but yeah. I think, I think in any playbill, you're always going to see this and others. This yeah. And it's others usually that any and playbill, others. but I mm-hmm. think, but I think, I think when, when you're get I, and I think Tony, you can answer this like when on, on your like official paper or anything that says who you are in the show, it'll say, man one man two like who you're playing it's yeah i think in my contract it says something like i think it's i think they just said swing and like as cast as they say but i think when teaching the show i think it's just easier tracking wise they just say man one or sometimes they'll say pesci like oh the pesci track because you know it's it's changed so much over the years, right? Um, I think they just stick to a, a basic title, so then maybe they can change it as much as they want. <laughs> no, it makes sense. Yeah, well, yeah. as it just still gets smaller or just whatever they have to do, it, it totally works. totally yeah. yeah. So everyone, please also know that there might be different right? notations. Very interesting. So yeah, yeah. I have to ask this question. So also for everyone listening, um, I have a cold. I'm a little sick. So if you, if you hear my voice and I'm not normal, that's why. Um, and I could use some freaking Pedialyte right now. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I haven't had in- My heart goes a flutter at the sound of Pedialyte. <laughs> so can you explain to our non, like our non-performers, um, exactly what Pedialyte is and what flavors there are because everyone always hears the word Pedialyte but no one exactly mm-hmm. knows what it is. So well or- originally I think it was for toddlers. Yeah like I for remember. babies. I-, I loved it when I was a baby. Yeah I never ha- I never heard of it. <laughs> never heard of it. <laughs> um it's basically just like a uh, a drink with a lot of electrolytes and a little more sugar than I would like but also I think there's some vitamins in there. Um that just keep you extra hydrated. And so um, I don't really, I think I learned it from uh, my friend who, who was doing a show that was very intense vocally and she was always drinking Pedialyte. I'm like, what is that? And so I started drinking it before shows whenever I could run into a Walgreens or something. And so you know, as you know, there are water breaks built into the show for Frankie because he literally doesn't leave the stage. Frankie's and gotta hydrate. Exactly. God hydrate or it's a it's a long road ahead. Um, <laughs> and so we, you know, they would give us they asked me in the beginning, you know, what what do you want in your water bottle water bottle? What do you want in any of the cups? Uh or you know, in Fallen Angel, one of the cups. I didn't know about the other hidden water break. Uh, which I'm still bitter about. Um, And so they, I just didn't want to be difficult or make people do any extra work as a swing since, you know, I didn't really know how often I was going to be going on. So I just said water, but I really should have said, I want my Pedialyte in, in those cups because I don't know, maybe I could have sounded better. I don't know. (laughs) Well, it would sound great either way, but but can you get like, (laughs) now like in a regular store I, I never see it I don't know if I'm looking for it yeah so you you literally have to go to the baby aisle to get okay. it to get it and okay. so um you know they sell it at 
Rite Aid or, you know, Walgreens, any of those drug stores. Yeah. Um, they are like $8, which is kind of excessive, but uh, it's so worth it. Oh, yeah. You know, it's a big bottle. It's incredible. Yes. Okay. At least it's big. That's what matters. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's the perfect hangover cure. Ayo. It's so great. It's so great. Can you tell us the story about when Quarter Simmons came to fill in? Yeah. So um, uh, Johnny had to be out of the show uh, for an injury for a weekend. And so they, we were in Providence. And so Quarter came down, Quarter Simmons came down to just fill in for the weekend. And so uh, there's a scene with Gaudio, the um, coffee shop scene. And for as long as I'd been doing it, there was never any water or anything in the cups. And so Quarter comes in and I hear him talking to the stage manager after his first show being like, hey, you know, they're, you know, he's the kindest, kindest person. He's like, hey, there was actually no um, water in the coffee cup in the coffee scene with Gaudio. And I was like, that was an option. We like, we could have water because, because Johnny just never needed it. And so, you know, they, they never put water in the cup when I was on. And so I should have asked for, for water every time I was on, cause I really needed it. But, um, that was the, they were jipping me on the, the water break. Hey, you did Jipped it. To Carlo. Jip to Carlo. There you it is. Did it. You <laughs> did it. <laughs> Look at you. He's grown up so quickly. I know. God, <laughs> they grow up so fast. I could definitely see you playing jip with your hair. Oh my God. With his gray hair. I know I'm, I'm already on my way to playing jip to Carlo. <laughs> I didn't even notice it was gray just the height. oh it's full oh it's fully gray well you know you, fully gray? you know you yeah. oh yeah look at it I can't really tell you can't it's, oh. it's short on the sides but it's yeah. the sides are fully gray I mean you, you mentioned last night I was like nah he's kidding you know yeah oh no wow fully gray. well yeah. very very dignified yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's very in anyway with the silver I guess so I guess so <laughs> yes own it the next Anderson Cooper there own it go. live it love it Yes, yes, that's the huge <laughs> motto. <laughs> well, why don't we take a quick break? And yeah, then, great. Yes, and, and we'll be a real deep dive into pure Frankie character. <laughs> and we're back. Oh, I missed the click, and we're back. Or the <laughs> 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 we're back. Tony Lawrence Summons, who is telling us his amazing story of how he went to Pace and he all these wonderful shows, Lincoln Center, they got Frankie Valley. It's a beautiful story. And he's only 28 years old. Not only, oh God. 28 <laughs> years young. We're good. Exactly. exactly. Yes. <laughs> we're millennials. We're, we're yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, we're good. So do you consider yourself a millennial or a Gen Z? Because I know millennial. you're definitely millennial. We're, I feel, on the cusp. we're millennial Zs. It's millennial true. Zs. What's the cutoff? <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be 95, 96 ish, but it's depending where you read. Oh, so, I don't know. How, do, how do you read? How do you hear it? How do you hear it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's, d- let's dive deep into Frankie's. Frankie Valley is baby boomer. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no. He's before baby boomer. Way before. What the fuck? Oh, yeah. What would he be? No, he's, he's a depression kid. Depression era kid. Depression era. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's okay. an icon. That's all we need to say. He's an icon. He's an icon. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> well, that's like cut that. Out. I'm just thinking. He's, he's yeah. icon Z. <laughs> right. Icon exactly. Z. That's so funny. Okay. So Belleville, New Jersey. Here we go. Let's dive in. Yeah. All right. So, now where to begin. There's so much really. Um, so hmm. We, so David always talks about how silhouettes, of course, the name of our show, um, mm-hmm. in terms of difficulty is wild right off the bat. So yeah, but I love how that when you said that was like the first one of the first things that really stuck out to you. Of course, mm-hmm. the entrance. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um. Can you also talk about how you approach? I can't give you anything but love because there are different Frankies who trust it or who do the falsetto. What do you do? Sure. So uh, I'll start with silhouettes. Um, that. I mean, that part is terrifying to begin with because my, my it sits a little low for me and, you know, right off the bat. And I think that's why it stood out to me so much was because there is, there's such a shift. Um, you know, you hear these amazing bass notes from Nick in the beginning, it's very grounded. And then all of a sudden there's this switch to 
this high falsetto. And so um, I knew that that was an important introduction to the world of Frankie. Um, so I kind of did struggle with that vocally in the beginning. Um, and also like the sound on the bridge is also sometimes kind of questionable depending what kind of venue you're in. Oh, so, wow. so sometimes it's hard to hear yourself and when, you know, yeah. um, and Danny Austin actually asked me uh, during tech, he was like, can you hear yourself up there? And I said, um, no, no, not really. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of lost. So I don't really know what's going on. And he goes, okay, great. Good to know. Always ask for what you need. Mm. And I said, great Bible. Like I'm taking that as Bible. Yes. <laughs> um, love Danny. And so, um, and then I can't give you anything but love. I don't know if I initially, I don't know if it evolved. I think I maybe had always just uh, chested the last note again, because the note just sits a little too low in my voice. And I, I think it's important to show that Frankie really is a singer. And so in my voice, particularly, it sounded a little lame singing it in my head voice. And, um, you know, I was like, I, I gave you the falsetto at silhouette, so I'll give you a little of the chest for this one. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I, yeah. it, it, it does, I mean, it's an A flat. It does sit in that very awkward position yeah. in the break. My, you my know. break is a little higher than, yeah. than that. So I was like, ah, I'm just going to just going to chest it. And no one said anything. So I just kept e doing it. Even in silhouettes, you said that that B right at the beginning is still is a little bit low. So yeah, yeah really so how did you, how did you learn to tra to traverse that ever changing relationship between all the three vocal qualities required from Frankie to sing the show you know which yeah. so and like which songs were you specifically directed to sing a certain way and which songs did they tell you that you could play with within the world of Tony Lawrence Clements voice um i think specifically um there was never any because the thing is, they never, at least they told me, they never want an impression of Frankie Valley. Like, that's not what they're looking for. Um, so they really want you to bring your own voice to it. But of course, you, you have to have that, that pingy falsetto and you need to, you know, really um, nail the essence of his voice. Because ultimately, if you're trying to do an impression and not using your own voice within the show, I think it could lead to injury um, mm -hmm. if you're like trying to put on this affected quality. Um, so specifically in I Can't Give You Anything But Love in the beginning, they really wanted that very forward, nasally voice. Um, and I, I got a note about that, but like really push those notes forward into the mask to give us that tone that mm -hmm that everyone knows. I can only think of, uh, in Moody's mood, think what for my final callback, you know, act as though your voice is a trumpet for those, for those oh. higher things. Um, and you don't necessarily have to, um, there is some room for back phrasing in there, um, but then there are certain, you know, beats you really have to nail on. I know Aaron De Jesus told us that there was a specific way that he had to sing um, can't take in the show. So when he sings it at the cabaret there, he can play with and there are certain things that he can do. Mm. So do, do, do you feel like can't take was also one of those numbers that you had to sing a certain way or not so much? There were certain rhythm things that they were really, um, were real sticklers on. Um, Okay, so they're it has real, to do also with like technicalities of music. Yeah, they were really big on um, like nailing those triplets. Uh-huh. Uh, I remember nail the triplets and then, and then you can kind of like flow off and have some color to that and then go back to the triplet and then kind of fade off. There was also a note I, I would always get. Um, 
I love you, baby. And if it's quite all right, I need you, baby. One the lonely night, I love you, baby. Uh huh. Like there's a there's a. They they were really it's, it's it's the syncopation. Yeah, yeah, they were really big sticklers on that. Um. Ron, but at least the impression I got, work. they were really inviting to how I wanted to sing it, as long as it fit within the world of of the show. It's Ron Melrose really did such an amazing job making these tunes accessible mm -hmm. for this newer audience, for this newer generation, two thousand and four and beyond. Yeah, it's just, making it so making it like a little bit more intricate in ways that you. You won't know by listening, but once you're in the show and mm -hmm. if you know music, you can kind of see like, because he said, go up to anyone on the beach, say, hey, sing me eight bars of Sherry right now. They're going to sing you more what it sounds like in the show than yeah. what it sounds like on the original track. Totally, so, totally. So I, I, they're going to sing it a little faster, <laughs> a little faster and a little, <laughs> little bit more, a little bit more syncopated and a mm -hmm. little, a little bit cleaner, which is, which is what the opposite of the four seasons were. They were not clean. Mm -hmm. They were not sharp. Like that's why the, the, the dancing is just Completely. so like, yeah, but we, and, and we were talking to other people and then, uh, you know, some of the original Broadway cast members were like, the dancing wasn't really mm -hmm. such a, like, they weren't really making it look yeah was that hard. sarah who was talking about that sarah talked yeah. about it yeah um, they had they had like a little um transition where they had to go back and be like we're gonna make this the dancing a kind of a different thing yeah right yep. yeah mm -hmm. and but and, so, with the see the toys with the tour because like with um like and who loves you i like, didn't know i got that booty thing and I'm oh like, yeah 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 the girls <laughs> yeah that oh like that's that like I, how do you feel about that change like, I mean, I I literally never saw it happen, so I guess I, I don't. <laughs> and I think it happens so quickly, but I see what you mean, where it's just like, huh, like, like it's it's, it it seems like it's um in there just for the the fun like right. public consumption of just like exactly right. This is like we're sexy. This is a this is a fun little thing. The girls work so angels. hard in that show; they deserve to have. So, have a little booty drop moment. I agree. Yes. <laughs> despite despite the way that the way that their knees are feeling that day. <laughs> I, don't, I can't imagine. I well, well, so for the third national tour, I, I feel like, like the branding of the show has definitely changed. Like, for neural stages, it was like pure sexy. Mm -hmm. um, like, like for the for the video promos with Keith Hines and Jenna. Yeah. And, like, I, oh my god, Jenna. I love that girl. Yeah, we love Jenna. Um, she joined she joined our tour later on. Oh, she did. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Didn't know that. Yeah, I remember. She did tell us that. Yeah. Um. So, well, did, did you did you feel like maybe the newer audiences was expecting something different because the branding changed? Um. Like, um what do you think? Yeah, I think I think a lot of the branding may have been That's the same. Because question. I, I yeah, I remember in Atlantic City, we had that huge billboard in the lobby of. Keith and Jenna and all the I, I don't know any of the other people who are on there but um it is so funny to see you know those promos like with the car and the flashing lights and I'm like this the show is sexy but like the those press materials were so sexy like in a great way but I'm like to me I was like does this really like match what we're doing on stage because it kind of doesn't feel like that but it is, you know, it's, you got to get the, those seats sold. And um, I yeah, certainly don't think any that. disappointed when they come to see Jersey boys. No, of course not. But, but, or it's well, like, this isn't what I was expecting. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just curious. Cause like we, we love more, the marketing team at Dodgers. Like, Jessica Oh, it's, Dodgers. I mean, the marketing is so good. It's the it best. is sexy. And, but the choreography definitely does reflect it. So I'm sure they mm -hmm. had to make some little changes and yeah, the music too. Cause we talk about this all the time on the show, but I think what's, um, with what Rick Ellis told us, I think that kind of changed the game for how we kind of approach the questions for the, for the episodes too, because um, like Rick was talking about the jukebox musical, of course, and how everyone thinks like Jersey boys is, is like one of the main jukebox, but it's like, mm -hmm. 
But the beauty of music, music in general, whether it was written for the stage or whether it was originally pop music, is that you can speed it up and slow it down. And the reason why the Four Seasons music is like is so iconic is because even last year there were two covers that were that went huge, like the Illy song. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and those commercial. I forgot what commercial it was, but it was a national commercial. And there was, um, I forgot his name. It was a Latin artist. Who um who also had a different version of Can't Take too. And then oh, Sean really? Sean Mendez. Yes. Did it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Sean. Yeah, it's it's all over movie. TikTok. Yep. Right. Exactly. Something like this. So how, how did you feel hearing those new versions as someone who played Frankie? I mean, I think it I think it really like, speaks. <laughs> well, no, I really think it speaks to the material. It, it really is so timeless and it really, it is so malleable that it can be turned into different things and still be a complete hit. I mean, when I first heard that, that song on, I, I'm assuming it was on TikTok and I was like, first I was triggered. And then second of all, I, I was like, whoa, I was like, this is like a new updated thing and I, I think it's I think it's so cool that their music is able to Trends live in. on yes exactly whether it's the original version or some iteration that um someone came up with I think it's I think it's so cool so when did you know growing up when you could sing falsetto you know when I was growing up before puberty you know I was living that male soprano life Yes. Um, but then luckily when, when I went through puberty, I didn't have a crazy, um, the transition wasn't as hard as it is on some people. I, I never really, um, lost any part of my range, I guess. Uh, yeah. And you know, I never had to go through, uh, cracks really. It, it wasn't, something that I struggled with, thankfully. Um, but I honestly think the first time I discovered that I could really sing in falsetto was from that music teacher uh, who introduced me to the Four Seasons. She really pushed me to, especially when singing that music, really pushed me to strengthen those muscles because while yes, it is something that some people are just naturally born with, it's also something you really have to work at um, because it's really not natural, really, like, or at least it no, doesn't feel natural. Not. And so I worked really hard on that. And so when I was, you know, the first song I sang was Sherry, uh, in like a little Jersey boys medley and, or four seasons medley, I guess. And, <laughs> um, and, you know, there were some rough moments, but I figured it out and I realized that this is a part of my voice that, well, she told me is a going to make me money because not everyone can do it. So, and she was right. It made me a good amount of money, thankfully. And uh, throughout the years in college, I really worked at it. Um, and now it's some, sometimes the strongest part of my voice, honestly. <laughs> like the falsetto is kind of always there. <laughs> well, I'm very happy to hear that that puberty didn't affect your, your voice too much. I know, thankfully. Yeah, well, plus like growing up like in our era too, like, like no one, no one has a voice like that. You know. Yeah, no one really sang like that. And now you have, you know, the, well, you know, you had Freddie Mercury, but now you have the Adam Lamberts who are singing in the rafters and who's now singing with Queen. He, I mean, he was a huge vocal inspiration to me oh, growing Nick, up. Nick Jonas. He Nick Jonas. Like, like in select songs, he'll, yeah. he'll go into I still like. still get jealous. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Uh, and then also like. Na, 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 na. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I clearly know all the words to that. <laughs> Same. <laughs> well, so did you did you listen to boy bands growing up? Like, did you love them? Yeah, I mean, you know, I have I have an older sister who's four years older, and so you know, we were always listening to Backstreet Boys and and Sync. Um, and I wish I got into you know the older you know the original boy bands. Um, oh. but we you know we were '90s kids and we were um you know 98 degrees yes. and, uh, and all of them um yeah th those are my jams back back in the day awesome. so, we 
we did like we grew up with it for sure yeah yeah a lot of a lot of like guys at least like in south florida like our, our theater scene never really thought to even try it so right. there's something too um yeah okay, so you had your vocal lessons you, you had the falsetto the song mm-hmm. of vocal health. you did your exercises <laughs> do your exercises <laughs> so um well so were you taught early about vocal health and did you learn about it in college like how did you kind of come up with your own vocal health um like your like, wellness routine I guess yeah yeah so I it started in college when uh I was doing summer stock and we were doing rehearsals all day for one show and then performing another show at night oh and you were so, doing rep oh it was brutal making lit not literally no money but essentially no money you know it was it was my first um professional job and so uh I could never ever do it again but honestly one of the best summers of my life and so I was introduced to you know those little personal steamers and oh, literally the steamer that I used on tour right was the same steamer I had in that summer stock gig it has lasted me Amazing. all right. of these years nearly 10 years and so, um, <laughs> oh, so oh my God. why didn't I think of that? It's so clear. Damn it. Um, so that was a big thing, but you know, back then I was so young. I didn't, you know, I could literally do whatever I wanted with my voice and I would be fine. And then I was like, okay, we're, they're a little swollen. We got some allergies going on. So I use my steamer a lot. Um, I, pull on my tongue a lot which is something I learned in college where you know you stretch your tongue out to get rid of any tension um I would warm up before every show and that was honestly something I started on tour because I never used to warm up really Mm -hmm. and I was like this is a show where I really need to make sure everything's aligned make sure everything's in check um sometimes I use some glycerin to like coat the core or coat the throat I also love throat coat. I love tea, you know, all those things. Um, and, you know, you kind of have to offset all of the uh, drinking that you do on tour because that's also a necessity when, <laughs> when you're on the road. You After the show, you got to have a cocktail or two or three or four or five. <laughs> but, but, not, but not every night. Like, you can't, you can't do it. Uh, you know, I... I <laughs> yeah. maybe not every single night of tour but yeah. you know a beer you know mm-hmm. it would be fine oh, um that was good to know but, right I, I, just and that yeah. right I mean that's that's some and you know obviously when I'm like okay I need to like chill a little bit I'm having too much fun in Chicago or like you know whatever <laughs> city we're in I, I still take voice lessons um because, you know, use it or lose it. Because for a while I didn't sing during quarantine. Mm-hmm. And the first time I tried to sing, I was like, oh no, yeah. I've lost a lot. So um, I always just try to keep singing and try to keep it going because as I found out, it's not pretty when you don't use it. It's right. hard. Yeah. It's a muscle that you got to keep training. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite vocal warm up? I well, I love uh, warming up with a straw. That's what they tell um, all Frankies, right? Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know. No yeah, one yeah, that. yeah. Oh, oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. So sabotage. <laughs> yeah, all, all, all Frankies. The uh, Katie Agresta has them do that. The straw. I love the straw. Um, what is I also. It? Okay, so basically, I have a straw right here. Okay, so what you do basically, what it does is it. You know, I'm not a voice teacher but this is just what I've heard. Um, So when you sing through the straw, it basically um, narrows your focus for um, like breath support. You can also like blow into um, a glass of water um, because the pressure of blowing through the water does something with like just keeping your cords together and it just kind of like lines everything up perfectly the way that it needs to so that's what I like to do um I also like to put on music and sing along to it stuff that I know is um complicated and so on tour I would always sing um 
I would pull my tongue and sing Dying in LA by Panic at the Disco. <gasps> the yes. album. I would also sing Sarah Bareilles' cover of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road off of her live album what? Uh, in Atlanta, just because, you know, it goes up into the falsetto. And it, truly, if, if I didn't sing that song before I went on stage, I became a little superstitious. Oh. I just was not uh, there vocally the way I wanted to be. So everyone would always hear me singing Yellow Brick Road, singing along to Sarah, my girl. I love that. That's, oh, I see. Yeah. This, this is the kind of stuff I, I love to know. Okay, so that's your vocal health. Um, mm-hmm. And okay, so what houses, since you've been on, on tour, um, mm-hmm. have the best acoustics for you? I mean, I think a lot of people will say the Fox um in we played the fox in atlanta is that the one with the beautiful blue yes roof and honestly that was a bucket list moment for me i always wanted to play the fox and luckily i got to go on i think for our final show in atlanta i got to go on for frankie and the fox and i will never forget looking up during during My Eyes Adored You and during Fallen Angel, looking up at that blue ceiling, it is truly one of the most beautiful theaters I've ever been in. It looks like you're performing under a sunset sky. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what isn't. Those arena shows where we we would be literally in a hockey arena, really some of the hardest shows I ever had to do were in those arenas. I don't know how these huge pop stars do it. Well, you know, we they have their in ears, so like they can oh, control what they hear. Right. But you know, we we don't have those, and so the sound in those theaters is so. I can't. It's not even a theater; it's an arena. Right. Um. Really, really crazy. Um. I, I know. What these arenas? It's- and a lot of times, the the floor was like wasn't quite level, so we weren't able to have the automation for the microphones to come out. So how would that because work? It, so basically two of the swings thankfully i never had to do it <laughs> but they two of the swings would come they'd be wearing their suits and they'd place the microphones down and walk off stage oh my gosh and i was like wow this is whoa we're uh, we're really doing this huh now was that rehearsed did you guys come up with that um yeah i think it was just a um or like hey uh, go, go bring down the mic yeah, it was just a crazy backup plan that I think they felt like. Okay. I'm, I'm sure the year before I got there, they ran into some problems. Um, and luckily, a lot of times we knew when the automation wasn't going to work. Then other times, these poor people had to get into a suit in like two minutes to to put the microphones on that spike tape and call it a day. Holy shit, man. That's crazy. To me, uh, that that would be more stressful than like than going on for Frankie. I'm like, I, I don't I can't mess anything up. Like I would rather go on for Frankie than place a microphone on the stage because I would be way too overwhelmed and stressed to do it. I know to it's quote, the simplest things that stress you up. The most. simplest thing, 100 percent Uh-huh. Absolutely. To, to quote Carlotta from the Phantom of the Opera, the things that we do for our art. <laughs> oh, it's true. I was like, oh I mean, if, if you so, it like out outsider perspective it's like oh you're in you're in an arena that's awesome congrats but it's like no it's totally yeah truly some of the hardest shows that we had to do the village where all the costumes are um for the quick changes oh oh, 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 you're talking about (laughs) inside the theater (laughs) yeah so like there was the village where everyone all the costume racks were lined up everyone had their designated spot and there were times where for some of these quick changes we had to run down a set of because the stage was elevated in these arenas so we'd have to like run down a set of stairs to get to our quick change area and you know the costume changes are pretty tight to begin with so when you have to factor in running down a set of stairs Mm -hmm. when you're used to just like walking behind the band to do a quick change it's very stressful wait but mary delgado has an eight second quick change coming out of the car well that that (laughs) right Imagine if she had to run all the, that. I mean, oh, okay. Watching, so that was rehearsed. Okay. Oh, that is truly it's that costume change happens barely off stage. Mm-hmm. Like, right. It's all happening in the car. It is li- it's li- <laughs> literally some of it happens in the car. And then 
she runs into the wing and literally stands there watching that costume change is truly magic wow. um yeah. watching that happen is really really crazy yes. but it's okay. essentially on stage you know, it's the, so fast that very quick change is just as magical as elsa's dress it literally it, it is truly down to a science i think there are four people working on her for that change it's it's really really crazy so the, cool. the magic of theater the magic of theater the magic of everything you know i so know we we, we develop so going into going into some more niche script stuff mm -hmm. you know uh we developed a term called rope acting right so like think about it when tommy and frankie are you know they're having their conversation after you know after i can't give you anything but love and um i ain't your little brother right and mm -hmm. tommy and, and frankie's walking away and tommy's like oh you sang good reeling him in, reeling him in with the rope, pulling him in, right? So we developed this term called rope acting and we kind of paired it with the already established backting, you know? Mm, and, a lot and of so acting in Jersey Boys. A too. lot of backing. <laughs> so going back to the scene that I was just referencing, so Frankie, we came up with, Frankie deals with conflict differently in the beginning of the show versus the end of the show. There's a, and there's a big kind of full circle moment that we were thinking about, which spans the entire show. In spring, so they're doing the car trick. Tommy's doing the car trick. And he starts teasing him. And he says, come on, little brother. Uh, finish the line, Tony. Um, uh, oh, come on. Little, don't do that. Don't hit, don't hit me. Come on, little brother. And ain't your little brother. Exactly. I ain't your little brother. Still got it. Yeah. Still got he it. still got it. <laughs> right. And after this line, he turns his back on Tommy and walks away, not wanting mm -hmm. to deal. Of course, with the rope acting, Tommy pulls him in with the fucking rope. Mm -hmm. And you say good tonight. Keys. Exactly. You saying good tonight. Now, who knows? Maybe Frankie had a short temper. Maybe he had a bad night. Uh, but maybe he had enough of Tommy shit. He just wasn't in the mood to deal with it. Mm. He didn't want to confront the conflict. And then all the way in winter, after working, he happens, to, and Gia pointed this out, he happens to be on the same side of the stage, stage right, as the confrontation with Tommy. Oh, yeah. And then the phone rings for him to hear that his daughter died. He doesn't turn his back, and he confronts the issue. He walks to the phone. He doesn't turn his back. Do you think that this is, like, there, like what's, what's the level of, what's that, there there's a, seems to be, like, a maturity I was just going to say, I think it's, I think it is maturity. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, Frankie really looks up to Tommy. And so to hear that validation of you saying good tonight, that kind of piques his interest where he's like, okay, like, yeah, you're messing with me, but you also care about me and you see me and you see that I have this talent that you are trying to nurture and I think that's very intriguing to him and I think yeah I think Tommy as a character is he knows exactly what he's doing in in every moment whether um whether it pans out well for him <laughs> or not um I think he's uh very tactful um and definitely uses that to his advantage. But I think I think there is a maturity that happens throughout, and I think throughout the show, and yeah, he, even in summer when uh, Tommy goes to hit him, and Frankie catches he blocks him. that slap, and that's the first time you see mm -hmm. that Frankie is starting to stand up for himself. And I think that's something that was really important to the creative team when crafting the show, and they definitely. Um, relayed the message to me where you know the beginning of the show should be completely different than the end of the show because you know so many years have passed and of course it's the same person but you know no one is the same person they are honestly even a year ago and so I think that arc uh is is super important to um portray and I I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out when I'm, you know, not on stage and sitting backstage being bored, wondering what to do with my time. <laughs> do you think it's possible as an actor to make a discovery halfway or 
three quarter, even three quarters of the way, or right at the end of the show, to have a discovery about something in the moment that they didn't realize two and a half hours before, and then suddenly change along with the character. I think so. I mean, I I think really the only way to do that is to listen and stay present in the moment. And if you, you know, they always say like drop in, like if you're, if you're really listening to your scene partner and even trying new things, like try literally trying a new way to say a line, I think can really um, create some really cool discoveries as an actor. And those discoveries can completely inform the way that you do your next show. Of course. I love that. Yeah. Well, with going back to what you're saying about, about the maturity, because um, I feel like, ooh, you said something that really sparked something with me. Um, when Frankie is going to answer the phone, it's, it's because he, you're right, because he, he did look up to Tommy, of course, in the spring, but mm -hmm. he, he learned from Tommy's mistakes and what, what, what pissed him off about Tommy. Totally. Same thing with Bob, but mm -hmm. never with Nick. Um, because Nick was just he was Nick. It was fine. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we, we we love it. Um, we love it. You know, so, but um, so I feel like he was he looked up to Tommy, but now Francine was looking up to to Frankie, but then mm -hmm. it was too late. Yeah, and I think that's excuse me um, just one of the saddest things in life because it, like, you always try to never make the mistakes of people older than you or people mm -hmm. who you but but I also understand if Frankie because he was so young when everything happened you know yeah. and, and you're mm -hmm. so young Tony that you know like and, and, and oh god like, thank you no, it's true <laughs> and, and we look up to you honestly that's like oh that's you, sweet you, you've done it you know but yeah but I feel like and like I think like Davina and I are kind of getting into that like mini mentorship like for like for incoming freshmen and like, it was, totally it was, totally like, and stuff like that but it's like it's hard when people put that pressure on you when you still feel like you're a kid yourself and I feel like with with these like with the band in like for Italian guys th there was no such thing as a role model exactly really. so it's yeah. like how can you expect that of anybody and I think that's right that's what really fucked up Frankie the most and it's so interesting that Francine died like so close to the end of the show because mm -hmm. there was nowhere for him to go. You know, everything yeah. with him was a dead end. Like, like, do you feel the same way with that? Totally. I, I wow. think, you know, you have the, you know, his career was still, you know, in full swing, but his personal life was kind of a wreck to put it nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think for him, that having it, his his daughter die really brought things to a screeching halt. And I think he probably had a lot of regrets with the way that he handled things on the road. And, you know, of course, you know, he talks about, what does he say? Um, I'm busting my hump to provide for this family. Like he, he genuinely thought he was doing the right thing. And I think in many ways he was, I think, you know, he was providing a, a life for them, yeah. but sometimes just supplying money isn't always right. what everybody needs. Of course it's stability, but like mm -hmm. Francine probably just wanted her dad, but he, you know, right. he was living this rock star life. Right. I can't give you anything but love. He couldn't even do that. And and I, I know, and I think I think he, I mean, I'm sure he has so much love for all of his kids, but I think maybe, I think for a lot of people, like you feel the love, but you don't necessarily share it in the way that some people need. And language. I think, I, yeah, literally love languages. Yeah. And I, 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 I wonder if he just thought saying I love you was enough and maybe it wasn't. And um, the movie, 
when he's he's talking to Francine as a little girl, he's like, so she asks him. They wrote the scene for the movie. He's like, she she's like, Daddy, do you love me? And he's like, Of course I love you, but do you like me? Mm-hmm. What do you mean? Oh. What do you mean? Of course I didn't see I that like part you. of the movie. <laughs> I, and he's like, I love you more than the stars and the moon and the sun rolled on. Yeah. Okay. And he ends it with, with like, with, it, it kind of, it's kind of like, he's, it's like a routine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I loved that addition. I thought that was really nice. And especially the fact that he brushed it off um, like that. Because he's like, yeah, of course. Because no one knows what love is, but, but you know what brotherhood is. Like that, it's neighborhood love. I know. That's, that's and I, right. And I, th- we, we can get into the whole thing about, you know, masculinity and what, no. what it means to, what it means to be a man especially back then, you know, you were strong. You didn't, you know, you didn't cry. You didn't, you didn't do it. You know, you can only do so much as a man. Um, and like how you're portrayed to the rest of society. Um, but, and thankfully now I think that mold is kind of hopefully being broken. We're like, it's okay, it's okay to cry and you should cry. And you should express how you feel to people. And um, yeah, I think times were just different back then. Do you think Frankie was caught in the middle with the band and the fame? Or did you think- What do you mean caught in the middle? Like, like with, of course he wanted to be on a national level and to be mm-hmm. as, as high as he could be and um, like ha- have the love of the fans but do you think maybe there's a part of the character of Frankie that maybe didn't want it? That's interesting. Um, I feel like, I mean, of course, I, I don't know what, you know, how he feels in real life. But I think in regards to the show, um, I think all of it was very unexpected. And I don't, I don't think he planned on this kind of fame. And I think it kind of just swept him away. And next thing he knows, he's being inducted into the hall or the hall of fame, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it was probably very easy for him to kind of get lost in all that. And it's so easy when you have all of these people like screaming your name and crying when they meet you and you know really going wild um and I think you know on a much smaller level even just being on tour with Jersey Boys it's so it was so easy to be uh stuck in that bubble Mm -hmm. where like sometimes you kind of forgot that there was a world outside of the tour you know you keep you keep in touch with your friends and your partners and you you do whatever but you know sometimes when like something dramatic would happen, you know, dramatic would happen on tour, Mm -hmm. you would like tell your friends about it. And like, when you're saying it to them, you're like, this actually isn't really a big deal. Right. (laughs) Um, And I think maybe it was a similar thing to Frankie where it was just kind of hard to see life outside of doing a show every night. And yeah, and until I, something does happen and then it, with, with your family and then it brings you right back home. Like that's, that's right. the first thing. Mm-hmm. But this, I don't think it's about fame. Like, so like I mentioned before. It's an alternate reality. I'm assuming, obviously, I don't know, but like. <laughs> no, well, of well, like, course you do. It was realistic with, with, with tour life. Like, like you have lived it. Like you've been all over the map, like the cockroach, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Like, please don't downplay it. Like, you're you're a poor <laughs> actor, really. Thank you for holding me accountable for, for well, taking no. a compliment. <laughs> um, so, but it's like okay, is I I and I was even asking um on my story like about three weeks ago. I was like just thinking about fame and like why people move to New York or, or do anything, you know, especially when people move here. I feel like because like you you come to be significant, you come to do something important, and then when you go home. You know, you think like you're, you might be doing the same thing, but you're like, yeah, but it's not in New York. It doesn't count. You know, that's sure. a big I, and yeah, yeah. Well, um, so, I, it's not like the whole Broadway or bus thing because that's that's what we've been mm-hmm. talking about. Because like, like art is art, and everyone needs it anywhere, and like its value is valued everywhere. And if anything, mm-hmm. it's valued even more in a place where it's never available. At least here, like, yeah. you can visit 
on the street or on the subway, you know? Um, but I, do you think we like, let's say like people our age, like we, we want to be famous and, and we see um, like maybe for the wrong reasons. And so we, we hear the story of Frankie Valley and he ignored like, the wrong side of the tracks, this band and like they, mm -hmm. but they got it. It's like, well, but like, I, like, I, but I want it. So why can't I get it? Like, do you, basically if, is wanting it too much going to jeopardize um, what you actually want to get? Like, do you think maybe that's a, a problem that a lot of millennials have to get past? Maybe. And I think, um, I mean, going back to social media, I think everybody, ha everybody has a voice and everybody has a platform. And I think the grass is always greener. I think mm -hmm. I'm sure that, you know, Lady Gaga would love to walk outside of her home and have some anonymity Yeah, and not be followed by people. And granted she she has this platform to do some amazing things but i do think that people want to be famous for the wrong reasons or they don't and sometimes like kind of don't even have the skills to like back it up they just have right. we just have this idea of what hollywood is or what you know what broadway is and what um what fame means and I think that the people who end up being famous, I think the most compelling people are the people who it just happens to by accident. Mm -hmm. Because I think that journey is way more authentic. Um, and I think it makes, a, makes for a better person. And in most cases, probably, I'm sure some people turn into complete nightmares, but, um, and it's even like, Something that I held on to for so long was not having immediate success after school. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, there were people in my class who went on to book Broadway right out of, right out of college. But I think there is something to be said about the, the couple years of the hustle and, you know, working 40 hours at a restaurant and also waking up at five in the morning to sign up for an audition because I think, you know, and of course not to knock people who have success right out of school. It, it's obviously incredible. Um, but I think the reward when you have those times where you aren't successful or you're not working and you are questioning why you're doing what you're doing. And then once you get that thing, it's, mm -hmm. I think it makes it that much more sweet. And you, 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 you treasure those yeses mm -hmm. more after getting all the no's. I know. But, you know, so it, 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 it might be, it might be harder for these people who book right out of school, who book right away to deal with the no's. Sure. And I think that it just, you know, everybody gets no's. And I, I think it just, um, it's just a delay of the no's. <laughs> right. I, exactly right every it's a time everything catches up to everybody at some point totally totally yeah and I think that's why Frankie like when he's like why'd you do it Nikki why'd you walk away you know it's such a loaded question mm -hmm. you know it's like why would you do this or it's like why yeah. would you leave me here with all of this right um, and it's just another example of never knowing what what someone's going through yeah that's true oh thank you so much so before we go, we are going to play a quick uh, round of uh, quick round of finish that line. Who said that? Say the next line with Tony Lawrence Clements. We're going to say a line and you have to tell us. Yeah, and you have to finish the line or we're going to give you a line. You have to say the next one. So let's get right into it. Gia, you got one? I got one. All right, here this we go. Is, fill the blank of that line, actually. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay, it, it's a line. For, it's from Davis, the program director at the radio station. Oh, no. <laughs> I always <laughs> had such a hard time with this section. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, well, it's not too bad. Okay, so they're talking about can't take, of course. Uh huh. Okay, oh, no. 
<laughs> it's okay. All right. So he's talking to Bobby and he's, he's like, Bobby, of course, for you, anything. I mean, come on, Marianne, that's a winner. But the other one, the blank one, how come the big push? The weird one. Perfect. <laughs> got right? it. You got it. Yes. <laughs> it seemed harder than it was. Yeah. Oh my God. I got so nervous because I, I would literally have to run through that every time I was on because I would just get so, I would get man one and man two confused. I would like forget which, which one I was playing. Right. So I always had to, I always had to check in with it there. You got it. Wait, so, so is that man one or man two? That's man one. Man one. Okay. It's new. Okay. That's mine. Is it ready? Okay. So, so this is a say the next line. So Tommy says, and if I say no, Frankie says, then you can get yourself another lead singer. Tommy says, what'd you say? Frankie says. <laughs> then you can get yourself another lead sing. And that's when they yep. blocks the slap. He, guys, he did it with the with the dash, with the cutoff. <laughs> Was that actually is that the real cutoff? I don't see a dash. Well, so the there's no dash, it's a period, but it's, okay. It's 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 a it's a it's a sight cue for Frankie to yes to stop and also the music to stop. It's yeah, the slap the slap would always be on sing. You can get yourself yeah. another lead sing. Good to know. Thank you. Love so it. now, so this is in the handshake scene. Okay. okay. Bob day. says, "We make a partnership. I give you half of everything I write. You give me half of everything you record outside the group." Well, how would I record outside the group? That's it. Hey. Very fast. Good and for then, you. And then and then Bob says, I don't know, things happen. Yes. Yep. Should we, should we do the whole scene? Yes. <laughs> this so is the scene so where I'm like, I get to have a break in literally 30 seconds. Thank God. Just get me through this scene. <laughs>